Hello, it's Griff. And I'm in Humboldt Redwood State Park right now. I'm actually in a dry creek bed, bed, not bread, bed, because I'm going to take you up to a future uh, project site that has everything to do with today's live presentation. So once again, if you're just coming on board, I'm Nature Guide for Humboldt Redwood State Park for the Ill River sector, actually, all the state parks down here. Naturalist, nature guide, natural resource interpreter, I got all kinds of titles. And I'm going to talk about what you can do to help me help the redwoods. And what you could do to help pretty much a lot of ecosystems in California, Oregon, and Washington, and beyond. Okay? But first, we have to hike to the area where um, most of this is going down. So, I wasn't watching the time, and I got... Oh, look at that. Beautiful... Uh, isn't that beautiful? It's a five-fingered fern. I wasn't paying attention to the time close enough, and so now we got to hike over to where I'm going to do my thing. So we're going to talk about Hedera helix, which is in the ginseng family. Does anybody know what Hedera helix is? Hedera, Hedera is a Latin word for ivy, and helix... What's up, Lee? Lee Perry worked in the Redwoods with me many years ago in the 90s. 97, 96. Um, Hedera is Latin for ivy, and helix means twisted. So we're going to talk about English ivy, which is a native of Europe and a non-native of here. Oh, look, here's... This looks like English ivy to the untrained eye, but that's California ginger, which smells super good. And here's a bunch more. Oh, it's beautiful down here. So we are going to duck under these. So Hedera helix was introduced, oh, look at that great, whoops, look at that great redwood sorrel flower. So Hedera helix was introduced probably in 1727. <laughs> in fact, I remember reading that somewhere. Because it was very admired in Europe. In fact, my ancestors believed that if you brought that it warded away evil spirits. So if you brought English ivy into your house, so my Welsh and Irish ancestors, if you brought English ivy into your house, that it would keep the evil spirits away. And the Greeks believed that, you know, they adorned the heads of the best athletes with ivy. And the, uh, the Romans believed that if you wore a wreath of, wreath of ivy, that it would prevent you from getting drunk while you drank. And their, their god of intoxication, Bacchus, is known by ivy and that's why a lot of european bars and stuff still call themselves the ivy because it's associated with drinking it is a beautiful plant so now we're going to start looking at an invasion hey sandra so it is a beautiful plant but it is an invasive species so what an invasive species is it's an invasive species is a species that's not native that comes to some place where it's not native and causes economic and ecological harm. Hey, Patty. So this is a English ivy leaf, okay? You all are familiar with this. It's an evergreen vine. It's, it's you know, evergreen vines are kind of rare. So it's evergreen vine. We don't have any native evergreen vines in Northern California. That's why so many people like it because it's evergreen. And it's in the ginseng family and it's not edible. Don't eat it. And the leaves aren't, eaten by hardly any insects in California. All the berries are eaten by birds and hence the problem. A lot of invasive species, and let's just define this real quick. Non-native species aren't necessarily invasive. So like wheat and rice and corn are all non-native species, but they're not invasive. Invasive means that they cause economic and ecological harm. It's just a small percentage of non-native plants or invasive plants. English ivy is definitely one of them. So it doesn't provide food for animals except for in its berries, and the birds eat it. I don't know if it makes them sick like it does humans, but they end up getting diarrhea and pooping the seeds out all over the place. And most invasive plants are what you would call pioneering plants where they came from. So, like, they liked disturbance where they're from. So if there was, like, a landslide or a volcanic eruption or a herd of buffalo that went through, then these plants would move through afterwards. You know, the hoofs disturbed the soil, and they would, like colonized in that because they were good cedars or whatever and 
when they come here, they have the same properties except for they no longer have their predators and competitors, okay? The things that kept it in check, the things they evolved with that kept it in check in their homeland. They come up here and they don't have that. So English ivy is enjoying that, not having its predators and competitors here, and it is taking over. And the problem with that is, is that it doesn't provide food for wildlife other than the berries that spread it. So it's... It's like if the blob moved into your town and it destroyed all the houses and all the restaurants and all the grocery stores and all the farmland, there'd be no place to live and there'd be nothing to eat. And that's kind of what English ivy does. I mean, it does provide cover for lots of animals, but there's no food. So it took away all the food. And that's a huge problem because our songbirds are already disappearing. Our insects are already disappearing. And insects are plankton of the land. We don't want them. And you look in here and you're like, wow, the English ivy looks so beautiful. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. Okay? But lots of things that are beautiful aren't good for you. Okay? Think about that for a minute. A lot of things that are beautiful aren't necessarily good for you. Okay? English ivy is one of those things. It's not good for us. It's not good for the ecosystem. It's not good for the economy. We spend millions of dollars trying to eradicate it. When I was in the California Conservation Corps, we pulled tons of it in places like this. Places on, you know, steep places, places covered in poison oak. And we pulled it to give the native plants a chance because a lot of the native plants are host to bugs. Yes, English ivy is in the ginseng family, Charles. Isn't that crazy? What's up, Jasmine? You've pulled ivy with me. So, the English ivy does provide a really good home for European snails. So, European snails are the snails that all of you stepped on as kids. They're the most common snail that you see. They really displace the, the natives. And I'm not sure how they did that. I don't know if they brought over diseases with them, but they were introduced in California in 1850. They came over, were brought over as food, probably also came over in potted plants like most other plant diseases came over in nursery stock. But, um, and pests and insect pests came over in nursery stock. So these were, this is escargot. Okay, so those of you who want to eat some escargot, there's actually some videos on YouTube that will tell you how to prep the snails in your backyard to be eaten. So those snails, they don't eat the English ivy, but they hide in it because they come out at night and, um, and they eat and then they go and they hide in the English ivy during the day so they don't dry out. And then a Norwegian rat, your favorite rat. So most of the time when you have rats in your house, it's not a native rat, it's a non-native rat. And it's, you know, another invasive species, and it's called the European rat. <clears throat> I mean, the uh, Norway rat, or the sewer rat. The sewer rat. Makes it sound ominous. So the sewer rat loves snails because it doesn't need to drink water when it's eating snails. And so it eats snails and gets the liquid from the snail. And then people are like, wow, I have so many snails and I have so many rats around my house. Like, what's going on? How come I always have rats and snails? And my beautiful ivy, it's because of your beautiful ivy, the reason why you have rats and snails. So you should pull it. Also, it's doing nothing for the ecosystem. And a lot of times when you, you have a bunch of ivy around your house and you have a bunch of rats and snails, your neighbors end up using poison. And a poisoned rat, a rat that eats rat poison, is now poison hawk food, poison owl food, poison fox food, poison coyote food. And they're taking these things back to their babies. So you, you if you're putting out the rat poison, are inadvertently killing a bunch of cute little wildlife babies. And you could get rid of those rats just by pulling all that ivy out. That would be a big help in the right direction, okay? So, English ivy is no bueno. It's still for sale in stores. I don't know why we sell a lot of invasive plants. Pl invasive plants are allowed to be sold in, in our stores, our big box retailers, even though the government's paying people millions of dollars a year to pull it out. Also, a lot of the reasons why we have poisons in our environment, like pesticides and herbicides, is because of invasive species, invasive plants, and invasive bugs. It's like largely what we're spraying for. Invasive species, like the COVID virus, are very expensive, very expensive to our economy. But yet, we still sell a lot of them, and people are still making profit off them, which I just don't understand. But you can do your part. Don't buy them. If you go to uh, cal hyphen ipc.org, California Invasive Plant Council. They have um, a bunch of resources that could help you, including the plants not to buy from stores, the invasive plants not to buy. And I don't know why they are allowed to sell them. I, something should be done about that. Also, state parks, we're trying to get rid of this invasive 
invasive plants, but there's way more of them than there are of us. So we have volunteer days, and it would be awesome if, when this COVID virus shelter in place is over, if you came out and volunteered with us to help pull ivy, and I will be there at some of those ivy poles. So please consider that. Also, plant natives, plant native plants, pull your English ivy, don't buy, inv don't buy invasive plants, and share this video and tell people the English ivy sucks. In fact, me and my California Conservation Corps members, we made a video on YouTube. It's called English Ivy Sucks. Yes, it's beautiful, but it has no ecological value. It's really bad for the economy too. And one day, if a person in the future could come back and talk to us, they would say, why did you guys plant English ivy everywhere? It has totally taken over. We have ivy deserts all over the place. And this is true. There's ivy deserts right now all over the United States where English ivy has grown up trees because that's when it starts to flower is when it grows up the trees and starts getting sun. It weighs down the trees and eventually kills them, pulls them over. It covers all the baby seedlings. Pretty soon we won't have the biodiversity we have today. We'll have English ivy deserts. And I really feel like that is just a couple hundred years away here in Humboldt Redwood State Park if we don't like get more people to help us volunteer to pull it. Thank you very much. Please share this video. Please plant native plants. They're good for insects. They're good for birds. They're good for habitat. You don't, all you need is a porch or a balcony. You don't even need your own yard. And, and thank you very much. Let me see some of your comments. It's funny because we can hardly get ivy to grow, but I know it's a problem there. Yeah, don't grow it. Um, it is pretty, I know. Pass on eating us now. Mmm. S-car, no, says Patty. It's actually pretty good. I had it one time in garlic butter when I was like 19. It was delicious. All right, so thank you guys very much. Join me again Sunday 3.30. We're going to talk about hummingbirds, I believe, because I've been checking out these hummingbirds, and I think it's time to talk about them. Please don't plant invasive plants. Please plant native plants. Go to Native Plant Finder. Just put in Native Plant Finder. It will take you a place. You can put your zip code in. You can find out what's native to your area, and you can help me keep the redwoods free of invasive plants. See you guys Sunday.